Hello, I'm Len Jarvis, contributing editor for Across the Fence, and today we'll explore the most remote inhabited island in all of the world, Rapa Nui, as it's known to the people who live here, but to the rest of us, Easter Island, discovered by Dutch explorers in 1722, famous for 877 stone heads called Moai. It's located 2,300 miles off the western coast of Chile in the South Pacific and it took us more than 30 hours of travel time just to get here. At the small airport, we were welcomed by Costanza Jaeger and presented a flower necklace made from bougainvillea blooms. Getting here was an exciting accomplishment for everyone. We stayed at Hotel Manotara just across the street from the airport. But not to worry about the noise, there's only one flight a day in and out of Easter Island. In the Rapa Nui language, we were welcomed by 74-year-old Mahatua. And with that greeting, we were off to explore Hangaroa, the only town on Rapa Nui, a 15-minute walk from our hotel. A territory of Chile, the 5,000 people on the island, however, govern themselves with elections every four years and this is their parliament building. It's located on Avenue Atamo Tecena, the main street in Hungaroa, along with gift shops, small hotels, restaurants and the island's only supermarket. It's best to buy local like these sweet potatoes as produce not grown here has to be flown in and is more expensive. You can't go wrong with fresh fish like these pumas caught in some of the world's most pollution-free waters. Soccer is big here and nearly 24 hours a day, local teams are either practicing or competing in matches to determine who will play on the national team. This is their church with a mix of Catholicism and ancient religious beliefs, which celebrates the importance of home and family. Flowers like nasturtiums and impatience grow wild along the road and I was comfortable here with a tranquility similar to when growing up in southern Vermont. I think you can tell what a place is like by getting to know their dogs. In some towns they are afraid and slink away, but here they want to show off and get their chins rubbed. I think this says a lot for the people that live in Hungaroa. After all that exploring, a good meal was in order and it didn't take long to decide on the Kaimana Inn, whose specialty is Rapa Nui Lobster, large or the miniature Rape Rape. We chose the large one and were invited into the kitchen where Chef Teresa began the preparation. And with a lot of butter, into the frying pan it went. And in a matter of minutes, our elegant first meal on Easter Island was ready. For you lobster fans, I wish you were here to enjoy this along with me. If you are not sure where Easter Island is located, let me explain with the Polynesian Triangle. At the top is Hawaii, to the left New Zealand, and on the right is Easter Island with Tahiti in the center. Recent radiocarbon tests show that the Rapa Nui's first people came from small islands near Tahiti and they called their discovery the belly button of the earth. Aku Aku guide Elena Araki explains. Around 300 AD was uh, approximately the date when the first, uh, the seven explorer arrived here. They were obviously sent out by the king so they can seek for new land. Remember that the Polynesians were great navigators. They followed the stars, they followed the racing sun, the color, the color of the ocean or a bird flying will be um, telling them that they are close to a piece of land. That's actually the, the evidence they look for in the middle of the ocean and they arrived here probably by accident. Yeah. 
But once they uh, arrived here, saw that the, the three crater of the volcano has water, because it's uh, accumulation of rainwater, and uh, there's plenty of vegetation, and nobody ever has been here. And then the seven men managed to go back to Polynesia, and then the king set with family to come and settle here. And this is the landing place of the king. Uh, so uh, that's why to us, this place is very special and very sacred to us. It's the, uh, the home of uh, King Hautumatua. Not far from the beach are the remains of an ancient village where some of Rapa Nui's first people lived. And if you can guess what this is, you should have been an archaeologist. What do you think? Here's a clue. Yes, chickens came with them and were an important food supply. What you saw is where the chickens got their drinking water. And this is their stone coop with a small door to deter predators that hunt after dark. For several hundred years, this small island of just 150 square miles, with its mild climate and plentiful food and water supplies, flourished and was home to more than 10,000 people. Then one day, about the year 1100, archaeologists say a stone statue appeared on a ridge that led to an obsession that nearly wiped them out. For almost 600 years, these enormous stone heads called moai, their carving, moving, and putting them in place consumed the population. The moai were carved out of easily worked, solidified volcano ash found at the extinct volcano called Rono Ranaku. While many teams worked on different statues at the same time, a single moai took five or six men up to a year to complete. Only a quarter of the statues were put in place, while nearly half remain at the volcano quarry. Most archaeologists believe that the moais, that can weigh up to 82 tons, were placed on logs and some 200 men with ropes and crowbars would push and drag them to their final destinations. An ahu, which is a raised platform standing several feet above the ground, gives the moai a more godly appearance. Some say the statues indeed do pay homage to their deities who watched over them, while others say they represent the deceased kings or chiefs from one of the nine tribes on the island. I expect it's some of both. But whatever the reason, here is their greatest achievement, Ahu Tangariki with 15 Moai. It's located downhill from the volcano making it easier to move the stones. The tall one in the center weighs 86 tons, the heaviest ever erected on the island. Life was good and the people danced. Then came their demise. Prodigious quantities of timber was needed as the competition between tribes for more and larger statues became all-consuming. Without precious trees, they were trapped on their now arid island, unable to escape the consequences of their self-inflicted environmental collapse. Mania wiped out sensibility, and a society that had prospered for more than a thousand years fell along with their magnificent stone heads that were knocked down as a civil war erupted between tribes as they battled for precious food and shelter. Less than 2,000 people survived and were reduced to living in caves on starvation diets. About 1760, significant social and cultural changes took place following the end of the Moai era. The tribes came together at Orongo to carve out a solution to end their civil war in what has come to be known as the Birdman Competition, Aku Aku guide Samuel Atan Tuki explains. The democratically way to choose a king was making a competition called the Birdman One. Uh, so, in fact, this competition consists in that the whole competitors 
who was representing a sponsor, the chief, I came to this area to spend at least a month in springtime because in that time migrate a bird that the local people were used to call it uh, Manutara. So they came here, they spent more or less a month in the house that we already saw. And when the, the Manutara arrived to the very islands, they tried to climb down the cliff, swim until the big island called it Motu Nui, uh, and at least spend a night there. So they were used to swim until they're in a kind of embarkation made by reeds. And the idea for them was to get the first egg of this bird. So after that, they took the, the, the egg, tied in the front, and then swim back in the same embarkation to climb up again the cliff and gave this uh, egg to his uh, king or chief. So in that moment, the winner became as a burnt man, as the people call it, and his king became as a king of the island for one year. And with that ingenuous plan, stabilization returned to Rapa Nui and their civilization slowly recovered. Until another, even worse event occurred in 1862. Rapa Nui businessman Tito Peoa explains. People from, uh, from Peru came to Easter Island, as well as other islands in the Polynesian, and took some slavery to work in the Wano collection in, in, in Peru. By doing that, people on the island were not immune to a disease, European disease, smallpox and whatnot. And most of them get, get uh, infected and most of them die from it in, in, uh, in Peru. And some of them were returned to Easter Island. Those returned to Easter Island were infected uh, infected the entire population of the island and wiped off almost the entire population left to the number of 111. And from that, uh, the rest of the Rapa Nui people emerged from that number. The few survivors in desperation decided to annex with Chile on September 9th, 1888, and these monuments commemorate that event. And now, more than 120 years later, you have seen what a fascinating and friendly place the island is today. But one might ask, if all the Moai were knocked down during the Civil War so many years ago, how is it we have seen so many standing again? Let me explain. We have arrived at Ahu Aki, the first site to be restored by archaeologists back in 1960, the team headed by American archaeologist William Malloy from the University of Wyoming. He spent 23 years here and for his work that brought Easter Island to the attention of the world, the government of Chile awarded him their highest civilian honor and a monument in his memory was placed at the Tahai Ceremonial Complex. To the people of Rapa Nui, William Malloy and other archaeologists who worked here are revered as they should be. Because of their work, the mysteries and legends of Rapa Nui have been solved and the Moai stand again as a unique memorial and tribute to the human spirit of all the descendants of King Hoto Matua. And no visit to Easter Island would be complete without a stop at the market where local artisans have beautiful examples of what their historic and mysterious island has to offer. As you have seen, it's so remote and so different from the rest of the world, it's going to be difficult to find just the right reminder of my visit. So let's look around together. Of all the things in the shop, I picked this muai because it so much represents Easter Island. This muai is known as Ho Haka Naia, and I liked it because it has symbols on the back. This is the moon, rain, rainbow, and up at the top is the bird god that we heard about earlier. What a fascinating and amazing place, and I must thank the staff and guides from Aku Aku Travel for taking care of all of our needs. 
We couldn't have done it without their help. The story of Easter Island is unique in all the world, but has left some lasting lessons. Because of an obsession for statue building, they destroyed the land, bringing about starvation and war. With ingenuity, however, they found a way to return to stability that lasted a hundred years. Then came the outsiders with disease and slave trade, and by 1887, their civilization was gone. Their story is one of epic human achievement mixed with some terrible mistakes along the way. Pretty much the story of human history, isn't it? I'm Lynn Jarvis for Across the Fence on Easter Island or Rapa Nui to the locals and to the ancients, the belly button of the world. Thank you for watching.